I want to read uh, from 1 Timothy chapter 5 this morning. I'm going to take the whole of the uh, chapter. Uh, it's largely to deal with uh, widows, and to some extent, of course, it's not so relevant today. Uh, when, uh, thank God, uh, we, through our taxes, can support those who are widows or have uh, uh, sicknesses, uh, permanent illness, that uh, they can be supported uh, by the uh, community in, in many ways. We may not like paying taxes, but it's one way in which we can uh, serve one another. So it's not quite so relevant, and there's a large section here on widows. I will touch on it, uh, but we'll move on to... Uh, other matters. So 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 1. Do not sharply rebuke an older man, but rather appeal to him as a father, to the younger men as brothers, to the older women as mothers, and to the younger women as sisters in all purity. Honor widows who are widows indeed, but if any widow has children or grandchildren, they must first learn to practice piety in regard to their own family and to make some return to their parents, for this is acceptable in the sight of God. Now she who is a widow indeed and has been left alone has fixed her hope on God and continues in entreaties and prayers night and day. But she who gives herself to want and pleasure is dead even while she lives. Prescribe these things well, so that they may be above reproach. But if anyone does not provide for his own, and especially for his own household, he is denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. A widow is to be put on the list only if she is not less than 60 years old, having been the wife of one man, having a reputation for good works. And if she has brought up children, if she has shown hospitality to strangers, if she has washed the saints' feet, if she has assisted those in distress, and if she has devoted herself to every good work. But refuse to put younger widows on the list, for when they feel sensual desires in disregard of Christ, they want to get married, thus incurring condemnation because they have set aside their previous pledge. At the same time, they also learn to be idle as they go around from house to house, not merely idle, but also gossips and busybodies, talking about things not proper to mention. Therefore I want younger widows to get married, bear children, keep house, and give the enemy no occasion for reproach, for some have already turned aside to follow Satan. If any woman who is a believer has dependent widows, she must assist them and the church must not be burdened, so that it may assist those who are widows indeed. The elders who rule well are to be considered worthy of double, double honor, especially those who work hard at preaching and teaching. For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except on the basis of two or three witnesses. Those who continue in sin, rebuke in the presence of all so that the rest also will be fearful of sinning. I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of his chosen angels to maintain these principles without bias, doing nothing in a spirit of partiality. Do not lay hands upon anyone too hastily and thereby share responsibility for the sins of others. Keep yourself free from sin. No longer drink water exclusively but use a little wine for the sake of your stomach and your frequent ailments. The sins of some men are quite evident, going before them to judgment. For others, their sins follow after. Likewise also, deeds that are good are quite evident, and those which are otherwise cannot be concealed. Well, let's pray that the Lord will enable us uh, to really receive something from him this morning as we consider the word together. Father, we thank you for these instructions. We thank you, Lord, that uh, in New Testament times they took seriously the care of widows. Lord, we pray too that we, as a body of Christ here, may be a caring community. We thank you, Lord, that we do seek to care for one another. And we just pray that you will continue to bless us, Lord. 
and uh, we, as we will be challenged again by the whole matter, those of us who are elders or preach the word, Lord, to act responsibly, and therefore we pray that you will help us. And Lord, we would equally pray that within the nation there may be godly example and godly living and good teaching, even this very day, from those who really know and love you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so we're talking about uh, relationships within the body, and particularly the first heading I've put up is family relationships. I thought these opening verses, uh, verse 1 to 3, uh, was a very good way of putting it. Because things do arise within the body from time to time. Uh, maybe there's disputes in some way, or maybe a lack of understanding, or even error that creeps in. Uh, maybe somebody's conduct is not quite what it should be. And obviously, Paul is pointing out to Timothy that uh, we are, as it were, a family that uh, you don't rebuke sharply an elder man, you respect something of his uh, age. The thing that I don't think we particularly do in today's uh, society, uh, when somehow it's youth that's uh, uh, seen as all important. But a matter of wisdom, I think, and understanding does come from, from experience, and we thank God for that. And certainly I would hope that as we are older in the faith, some of us, uh, we have gathered so much from the Word of God and such a great understanding from his word to enrich our lives so that we can reach other, enrich others. But here it is. Uh, if there needs to be some matter of rebuke, then treat the older ones like fathers or like mothers or brothers or sisters. But it does add in all purity. And I think that particularly applies to that uh, second part uh, because uh, many have fallen ill of, uh, of Satan, really, uh, when temptation has come along and wrong relationships have developed. And I've seen ministries over the years that have uh, come a cropper because uh, there's not been that, uh, that carefulness. And I think very often it's advisable sometimes for uh, an elder to take his wife along so that uh, there's no sort of wrong relationship that develops uh, when dealing with uh, the sisters in Christ. So there's good wisdom here. But just that word of warning. But isn't it good that we can see ourselves as a body of Christ? Yes, different members of the body, but equally the family of God. And we are to regard one another as brothers and sisters. And therefore we do care for one another. And we do want the, the best for one another. Here obviously is to be a gentle approach. But there are times, of course, when a much stronger approach is necessary. And you may remember when we were going through chapter 1 that Paul had actually delivered over to Satan, put outside of the church, uh, Hymenaeus and um, I think it was, and uh, Alexander. And uh, we know that uh, particularly Hymenaeus had said that the resurrection of the dead had already taken place, not uh, uh, Christ's resurrection, but in other words, that the Lord had returned and... Uh, some people would wonder why they were still here if the Lord had come. Why had they, they not been caught up to meet the Lord in the air and so on? Uh, why uh, was there no obvious uh, um, well, example of the dead actually being raised again? So uh, he strongly, those two are strongly rebuked for their error. And rightly so, because it was making not only a shipwreck of their faith, but a shipwreck of other people's faith. So we saw that that was a case where you deal very strongly with those who have not taken heed and not heard the warning. And in Titus we will see that a heretic is to be rejected after a first and second warning. But generally the right approach is always to, to do it in gentleness as a member of the family, those that we love in Christ. And then we come on to this matter of the role of widows. Uh, obviously, it's uh, very clear that uh, widows were in a bit of a precarious position uh, within uh, society. Uh, there were no benefits, uh, certainly no widows, uh, sort of, um, um, well, uh, what I, what's the word I'm looking for? Well, a uh, uh, matter of um, uh, the, um, hmm, when you take out... Uh, um, uh, a life, uh, 
life no insurance that's the word I'm looking for sorry uh, but uh, so they were in a pretty precarious position and we certainly know from uh, Acts 4 that the whole matter of uh, deacons were appointed so that they could look after the widows and when we were thinking back earlier in uh, 1 Timothy 3 about the appointment of elders and widows uh, we see that uh, there was that real care for them although there seemed to be some neglect of those who were Greek speaking and uh, so they appointed people so that they would not be overlooked that their responsibility was particularly to serve at tables as it says there and when it says serve at tables it may be to administer food uh, but that word serve at tables was actually used sometimes in a financial way so it may have just been allocating some sort of financial gift to these widows because they were, well, without support in the world. And it was right that the church should care for these members of the body. Just as we've already been reminded that they are part of the family of God and our brothers and sisters. So uh, here is uh, this, these regulations that are given very clearly as to what is to happen. Those over 60 were to be pointed uh, onto the, uh, the list, the role of widows uh, that would be cared for. Uh, otherwise those who are younger it says that they should uh, seek to marry but equally it's pointed out that uh, those who have family members should actually care for their uh, well their uh, elderly parents the right thing to do to care for their mothers who had cared so much for them and of course part of honoring our father and mother I'm sure is quite often to to take that proper care uh, of our elderly parents and uh, sometimes perhaps a little bit too much and wanting to restrict us in the things that we uh, do as I find my family sometimes wanting to do with me but uh, that's their care for me and that's good and uh, this is how it should be especially if we're believers Paul says we have a real responsibility not only because of that commandment but because of which uh, the way in which our parents have cared for us in a sense we owe them back something for their care uh, and for their upbringing. So it's laid out very clearly how things are to be done here. The younger women would be encouraged to marry again. And it does seem that the older women in some way had a role within the church. That uh, as they were being cared for by the church, that they would spend time in prayer. Praying for maybe other members of the family. Praying for things going on in the world as we're called to do. In fact, yesterday we had uh, within Intercessors for Britain in the evening uh, a Zoom time of prayer, praying about various things that were going on in our nation. Uh, we prayed for the church, that the church would actually respond to the burden of God's heart, to God's agenda and not to ours. We prayed about the matter of pornography, what a problem it is for young people these days, so easily accessible. The government is actually trying to, or thinking about bringing in a bill to make it more difficult for young children to be able to get onto these sites. Something that really we should be praying about for the well-being of our nation. And we should also remember that sometimes it can be a problem for folks within the church. None of us are, are immune from the temptations of the evil one. So it's good to pray about these things. And then we ended by praying about some of the elections to take place uh, in the future, both in Scotland and uh, particularly thinking of London and Tower Hamlets, where uh, one gentleman, well, I'm not sure whether I should call him a gentleman, but he was a bit of a crook, really, who was barred from office in the end because of all sorts of gerrymandering that was going on uh, within that borough. Good to pray about these things. We're told to pray for those in authority. And maybe in a special way these uh, women were praying, maybe still serving in a measure within the church. And so they were set aside and they committed themselves to serve the Lord in that capacity. It may have been the beginning of what we call nuns. I would imagine that would probably be the case. And so often what begins right gets extended and perhaps distorted over, over time. But nevertheless, here is the church being, or certainly Timothy and the church there in Ephesus being instructed how to look after people and care for them properly certainly uh, 
It points out there is a danger of those younger women. If uh, they didn't remarry, they could become idle and they weren't to be supported by the church. They didn't need it. They could perhaps in some way earn some income for themselves or they could remarry and uh, have a family and so on. Um, and certainly what Paul is saying that uh, if they were put on this role and if they were set themselves aside, uh, devoting themselves to Christ, perhaps taking some sort of um, uh, oath or promise to serve the Lord in that way, then their desires might go uh, in another direction later and want to get married again. Nothing wrong in that, absolutely acceptable. But that's why they should not be put on the roll, says uh, the Apostle Paul. There is a place for them to, as it were, uh, to find something of their own uh, living. But the whole matter of caring for widows is uh, given a great deal of attention in Scripture. It shows too that God is very concerned for the widow. Uh, she is left alone. God wants to, as it were, come alongside uh, and be a husband, be a support uh, to those who are widows. And uh, you may remember that James said that this is a, a, a true measure uh, uh, of devotion. Uh, in James chapter 1 and uh, verse 27, Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress, to keep oneself unstained by the world. A couple of things there, of course, not only orphans and widows, but keep oneself unstained by the world. Incidentally, that's something that comes out in this matter of widows, uh, that they were to make sure that they uh, didn't give any, um, or bring any uh, disrepute uh, upon the church, that they were to live in a way that was above reproach, and of course, again and again, that comes out in Scripture for all of us to live in such a way that the name of the Lord isn't brought into disrepute. That we live in such a way that His name is honored. Even if sometimes they criticize us for the way in which we do live. And perhaps uh, they would see it being narrow-minded and whatever, or bigoted. But we want to certainly honor the Lord in every way. I put down there Acts chapter... Uh, Chapter 10 and verse 39, which was a matter of Dorcas. You may remember Dorcas had died, and uh, Peter raised her to life. Uh, but all the widows were there and brought their garments. They were grieving for this woman who'd served them so well. Things that this woman had made for them. So not only is there, a, as it were, a, a real responsibility placed upon the church and the deacons caring uh, for these widows. But you can see that other people within the body were caring for the widows as well. Incidentally, I might add that, uh, thank God, within our society, as I've already said, that uh, we are able to care through uh, taxes and so on, to care for people within the community who are either, either widows or suffering ill health or in other ways, uh, need that support. But I think of places like Africa, where the present perhaps isn't that support. And uh, you may remember one time, particularly until very recently, uh, we were giving for uh, children alone in Zimbabwe. And uh, what was particularly happening there was that uh, many children were left orphaned uh, because of AIDS. And a sister we knew that originally was leading intercessors for Rhodesia and then Zimbabwe. Uh, she had a real concern uh, for these orphans and was encouraging the pastors of the churches to find folks within their churches to particularly care for these orphans so they weren't left alone. And uh, financial aid was uh, given uh, to help in that respect. I think Tear Fund uh, have taken it over now, but right up to last year, uh, Children Alone was uh, that organization that was working there, or one of many perhaps. But we can see that in some cultures, some societies, there still needs to be that sort of support. But thank God that in our own, it's not quite so necessary. But I do believe we should be at the same time seeking to care for one another. As members of the body of Christ here, as members of God's family, we need to make sure we're seeking to help those who are vulnerable, particularly perhaps when people are grieved, uh, grieving, 
uh, or when they're sick. You may remember in Matthew 25, uh, the difference between the sheep and the goats was the sheep really cared for other members of the body, Vis visited those in prison, visited the sick, uh, and helped in various ways. And as we do it to one another, we're doing it as to the Lord. He sees it as real service to Him because we're caring for His family, God's family. We're caring for Jesus' brothers and sisters, if we can put it that way. And that is uh, part of the outworking of our faith. We're not saved by those things, but when we are saved, we should be wanting to do those things. Well, that's all I'm going to say about the role of widows, but I think there's something of a challenge there, even although it's not quite so relevant today. And then we come to the rule of elders. And the word that is used here when it says the elders who rule well, it means to stand or set before. To stand or set before. It may be that they're set before in a position that should be honored and respected in some way. Uh, something of authority, but at the same time, we need to remember that the shepherd goes before. He leads the flock, and then again and again, the whole idea there in Scripture is not that we should lord it over people, and I think sometimes there's too much authority taken. Jesus said we were not to do that. Peter said we were not to do it, but that we should be our examples to the flock. Uh, there in 1 Peter 5, as he speaks about elders, and we looked at that uh, earlier when we were considering the matter of elders. But uh, the rule really is not the rule of a king, but the, the rule or the oversight of a, uh, of a shepherd. And remember, of course, one of the titles that is given to elder is an overseer. To watch over the flock. He's there in the front, if you like, watching over the, the fact uh, that maybe there's somebody that's, or uh, some animal, putting it in terms of the flock, uh, that is suffering, that is lame, that needs help. And from time to time, we all need something of that help. Maybe there's some correction, as I've already indicated. But there it is, uh, the elders who rule well, really it is the rule of a shepherd. And then it talks about having double honor. Uh, literally double honor, uh, but it seems to apply to the matter of in some way uh, some remuneration for the work that they do. And uh, double honor, maybe double what the widows got, I don't know. Or maybe it's saying that those who really do minister well in the word uh, should be recognized for that. But uh, the thing I really want to emphasize here is that it goes on to say, uh, you shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing, and the laborer is worthy of his uh, wages. That's also taken up in 1 Corinthians 9, where Paul makes it very clear he had every entitlement to be supported in the work that he was doing. But in actual fact, he said he didn't uh, uh, take that because he did not want to be a burden on the people. After all, if a church is just being established, then uh, you don't want to immediately load burdens financially upon them. Obviously, in time, then uh, there comes the opportunity to support those who serve the Lord. And again, he quotes there in verse 9, You shall not muzzle the ox while he is threshing. God is not concerned about oxen, is he? He actually is applying it to those who sow spiritual things uh, should they not reap material things in verse 11 there. And then he goes on in verse 14. So also the Lord directed those who proclaim the gospel to get their living from the gospel. I'm never quite sure why certain sections of the church don't believe in a paid ministry. After all, if uh, they have set them aside to uh, study the Word and to bring the Word on Sunday and to build up people and then to care for them in a pastoral way. Uh, it's good that there should be something in return. But some have uh, dismissed the whole idea uh, of uh, supporting uh, people in a paid ministry. Well, it's quite scriptural to do so. And then it uh, goes on to talk about uh, matters of misconduct, really. That uh, if... 
uh, an elder has misbehaved in some way, then uh, you shouldn't entertain any uh, accusation unless there are two or three witnesses. Be sometimes in some situations it's not easy to find two or three witnesses. And, uh, but I'd just like to remind you that in, Acts, um, sorry, in Matthew 18, that if a brother sins against us, that we go to them first and uh, uh, point out how they have uh, um, offended us or caused problems for us, and it's sorted out in a private manner. That's always the right way to do it. Uh, we don't go around broadcasting what others have done to us until at least we have first uh, sought to put things right in a personal way. And it goes on to say that um, uh, if he fails to take heed, then take uh, one or two more with you. So by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every fact may be confirmed. If he refuses to listen to them, Tell it to the church, and if he refuses to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. So there's a proper way of going about things. And I would think if there is some serious uh, thing where an elder is charged by one person, and this is to avoid frivolous accusations, I mean, after all, if somebody is rebuked, sometimes they want re to retaliate. You've only to see what's going on in government at the present time when... Uh, Dom Cummings has been uh, accused of making leaks. He wants to retaliate. Well, whether it's true or untrue. Uh, but we see how people lash out. And sometimes there's no good ground for it. And so the matter has to be examined thoroughly with uh, two or three witnesses. And if the elder has sinned, he needs to be rebuked before all, it says here. Uh, I don't know whether the all is the other elders. I think probably it does mean that, but of course it's, it's more serious than repentance. Uh, along with Matthew 18, the, the person has to be put outside of the church as a matter of discipline. Uh, so that uh, again in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, you remember immorality had come into the church and the man had to be dealt with. He had to be put outside the church, as Paul was saying, uh, because a little leaven leavens the whole if you allow your standards to fall, then other people begin to think they can get away with it. So discipline is for the whole body, as well as for the person, to actually bring them back to the Lord, uh, so that they may be in right relationship with Him. It's never to lash out. It's always to, to bring correction, to bring restoration. That's the important thing. That's what God would want, for a brother or sister to be restored. And sadly, again, sometimes elders have fallen into grievous sin. And it needs to be dealt with in a proper manner. Incidentally, Paul does go on to tell uh, Timothy there to keep himself free from sin. He goes on immediately to say, uh, drink, no, uh, uh, drink uh, water, no longer drink water exclusively, but use a little wine for your stomach's sake. It may be that uh, Timothy had gone a little bit overboard. You may remember when we were looking at uh, the whole matter of appointment of elders, that they said, it says they are not addicted to wine. I think the same thing was said there of, uh, uh, of deacons as well. Not to be addicted to wine. Perhaps it was a problem in society, maybe along with others. I, I think uh, there were certain sections within the Jewish community that uh, just simply wanted to drink uh, water. Uh, but water wasn't always that, uh, that healthier subject. It wasn't refined as well as it is today. And uh, maybe that was part of the problem. And so Paul is advocating that uh, he shouldn't simply be a, a teetotal, uh, but that he should uh, take perhaps a little wine for, for the well-being of, uh, of his body. So this was not, Paul was saying, this isn't something that is a sin. Uh, but you don't need to go overboard. You can drink a little wine for the stomach's sake. Well, we all need to make sure that we're dealing with the whole matter of alcohol in a responsible manner within the church. Because again, people have fallen foul. We need to be too an example. For myself, I've been largely teetotal on my ministry because I don't want to be a hindrance to anyone else. But on the other hand, if people want to have occasional uh, wine with their meal, that's no problem. 
uh, from a scriptural point of view. We just need to be wise on these things. But here was a bit of advice. Perhaps Timothy was taking it a little bit too far in not being addicted to wine. He wanted to avoid it altogether. So uh, then, um, oh yes, no bias when it comes to uh, the matter of uh, dealing with uh, uh, discipline amongst the elders. Uh, this is a very important matter, isn't it? We can sometimes be over-cautious or not wanting to offend uh, those that uh, are close to us. I remember a situation many years ago now when uh, we began to be a bit concerned about a fellow elder within the church. He and his wife had got very close to another couple in the church who were saying that the children of believers uh, didn't need to be born again. Just train up a child in the way in which he should go. Uh, and uh, when he's older, he will not depart from it. That was what they were fo focusing on. But of course, we all need to be born again because we're all sinners. We can't enter the kingdom of heaven without it. And I remember Val and I went on holiday with the children. And this had just been brought to my attention that not only were this couple saying it, but the elder and his wife were beginning to accept this uh, as something that was true. And I felt quite miserable on the first few uh, days on, uh, on holiday because I knew I had to go back and deal with this. And not only was there that situation, but uh, the two women in these two couples were getting unduly close to one another. And it was a concern that there was something unhealthy there. I have to say we were absolutely right in recognizing that because later uh, they were married. So you can see how this situation was developing was a very close friend of mine and uh, Val was very close to uh, his wife as well and uh, but I knew that I couldn't uh, show any um, how it's put here not to show any bias or partiality a spirit of partiality I knew the matter had to be dealt with particularly because error was coming into the church if others uh, began to take up this idea well it would undermine the whole of the gospel it had to be dealt with and we sought to do so. And in the end, sad to say, they didn't take the, the rebuke uh, that came not only from uh, the other elders, the other two of us, but um, another brother that we called in just to uh, show, so that we could show that we weren't showing any partiality. It wasn't us who were uh, laying down the law, as it were. And uh, they upheld what we were saying in that matter. So we do need to be careful and thorough in these things. In fact, I think it's quite uh, interesting that uh, Paul says at this point, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus of his chosen, and his, of, of his chosen angels to maintain these principles without bias, doing nothing in a spirit of partiality. Well, there it is. And we can see the reasons for that. Uh, but it also it talks about not uh, hastily laying hands upon people and thereby share responsibility for the sins of others. I just think how some people are appointed to the ministry today. Some that should never be in the ministry. I think in some of the other denominations where uh, same-sex marriage has been uh, uh, allowed and... Uh, homosexual relationships and uh, ministers and even transgender people now. Well, according to scripture, that is quite wrong. Uh, they will not enter the, the kingdom of God, it says, if they go on practicing these things. So if we actually appoint them, or we ordain them, we set them aside, we're actually, as it were, approving of their wrong behavior. So what the Apostle Paul is saying here is that those who come into eldership need to be looked carefully to make sure that there are no problems there that we don't hastily appoint people but that we make sure that they are in good standing before God and actually know the scriptures well because they're able to then teach and to correct others so that's uh, quite vital and then just really ending where it says uh, the sins of some men are quite evident going before them to judgment I don't know whether that means judgment within the body or the day of judgment. It may mean both in one sense. 
because, uh, well, as I put there, be sure your sins will find you out. My mum used to quote that to me, particularly when I've been caught lying. <laughs> Usually came out sooner or later. You've probably found that when you were youngsters, if you ever lied. Perhaps you were, never did. But, uh, of course, actually, it's a bit out of context. It was about those who were uh, entering into the promised land and who were going to settle on the east of Jordan. And uh, they had agreed to go on and to help them occupy uh, the land of Cana, and then they could return. And um, they're being told that if they fail to honor that, well, their sin will find them out. But it's a pretty good uh, uh, saying anyway, to take it generally, because our misdemeanors do have a way of catching up with us sooner or later. But equally it says here that those good deeds are quite evident as well. I hope it will be that in our own lives it's quite evident uh, that we are those who are seeking to the serve the Lord, to do that which is pleasing in His sight. Whether we're in leadership or whether we are just members, I shouldn't say just members of the body, because we all have a part to play. And uh, reproach can come upon the name of Christ if we don't serve him in an honorable way. Our conduct is always important. And of course, those things that we believe are important as well. Because as we saw previously, uh, healthy teaching gives a healthy body. And the church needs to be healthy in the sight of God. Well, just to sum up, uh, to remind ourselves that we are a family. And thank God for that. Thank God that we can pray for one another, we can care for one another, we can help one another, we can support one another. Uh, God has put us into a family. That's how he intends it to be. We're never to be an isolated member. We're never to be cut off from the rest of the body. We're to be within it, playing our part, but equally receiving uh, from others. And uh, I think last week, Ashley was speaking about the benefit we can receive as we share together. Just to hear how good that uh, Dave is making a, a recovery. I remember praying last week that perhaps it might even be seen from that point onwards when we prayed. It has ha ha happened with Jesus uh, when he was told of a situation. So we're family. We are one. Praise God. And then uh, uh, we should care for those who are vulnerable and even within society itself, seek to help those who are in need some way or other, uh, so that we can do good to all men, especially the household of faith, as Paul says in Galatians. And then, uh, it's gone, uh, uh, yeah, godly leadership is vital. The fact that there is this charge here, uh, where it says, um, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus and of his chosen angels to maintain these principles and so on. It was absolutely vital that there should be godly leadership for the well-being of the body. And uh, I would urge you to remember us in prayer, those of us who do lead and who minister the word, so that we may be a, a blessing to the body and a help to the body and building up the body. So... Uh, well, it's a long chapter, but I hope that uh, something has spoken to you there this morning. And uh, just the importance that God would attach to godly leadership and uh, to teaching. So let's pray. Father, we do grieve that in uh, some parts of the church, that there are those who are set aside for ministry who never ought to be. But Lord, equally, we thank you that there are those who have heard the real call of God and who want to serve you. And we would pray again, our God, that within our nation there may be those who will really honor you as they seek to minister the word week by week and to pastor the flock. Lord, we pray that you will raise up good overseers, good shepherds, good leaders, good elders, and Lord, too, those who have a heart to care for other people. Lord, we thank you for the way in which those uh, uh, within the early church, did care for the widows. Lord, teach us to care for one another. And to when one member of the body uh, suffers, that in a sense we may all suffer, that we may feel with them. And Lord, when another member of the body rejoices, that we may rejoice with them, seeing so much that we care for each one. 
And Lord, we pray too that in, within this church here there will always be godly leadership. Lord, when perhaps some of us have passed on, we pray, Lord, that you will have good leadership here to bless the people, to bring others to a saving knowledge of Christ, that the gospel may go forth in power, but equally, Lord, that your saints may be built up. Lord, build a healthy community here, a godly community. May we each play our part, we pray. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen.